Don't pay the oppressor money He's taking everything he can We've got to make our own plan Yeah man, we've got to make our own plan you know? Africa today receives consistently one-third of the total annual flow of official development assistance of some $150 billion. Yet, the average per capita income of sub-Saharan Africans has increased by just $350 since 1990 to just over $1,650 today. Put differently, donors have spent more than $1,000 per person over 30 years to lift the income of Africans by just $350. There must be a better way to do this. This is the central message of a new book, Expensive Poverty, which is focused on finding ways to fix the poverty pandemic, written by Dr. Greg Mills, the director of the Johannesburg-based Brenthurst Foundation. Expensive poverty seeks to answer the trillion dollar question. Why have decades of spending had such a small impact on improving the lives of the poor? This was not the intention at the beginning. On a frosty January morning in 1949, President Harry Truman delivered his second inaugural address. His speech focused on America's foreign policy goals at a time that the world was descending into what became known as the Cold War. President Truman's fourth point in his speech took his audience by surprise. He said, We must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. This aid, he declared, would come not in the form of money, but rather by spreading knowledge and expertise. Instead of giving food, the U.S. would help countries develop themselves in the best way to find prosperity and peace. In a world just exiting the bloodiest conflict in history, the idea was instantly popular. It appealed then, as it does today, to an innate humanity quality of being willing to help those less fortunate than yourself. Dollars in their pockets. Donors have poured 1.2 trillion US dollars of development assistance into Africa since the end of the Cold War, a figure that could conceivably be doubled if it included unofficial charitable giving. This 1.2 trillion US dollars could have provided a staggering volume of much needed infrastructure. It could, for example, have bought 680,000 kilometers of new two-lane all-weather highway or repaved all of Africa's current roads twice over. This money, spent wisely over the past 30 years, could have created extraordinary wealth in human capital as well. Instead, Africa has very little to show for this money. Most of it's been consumed some by the donors themselves, and much of it by local governments and elites. While it may have made things less worse, it has not proven the panacea that President Truman, among many others, had once hoped. Africa's share of global income has steadily been falling since the mid-2000s. People in the rest of the world are getting richer at a faster rate than Africans. The continent had become the site of the majority of the world's poor. Today, one in three Africans, some 420 million people, live below the global poverty line. Contrast this with China, the world's largest country, which has been the site of the greatest reduction in poverty over the last century. For the first 30 years after the Communist Party came to power in China, the development results were terrible. By contrast, the results of the re-embrace, since with market economics, have been stupendous. In 1990, China's average per capita income was just $729. Within 30 years, this had increased more than tenfold. Such growth has lifted more than a billion people from poverty in a single generation. 
this stupendous increase in wealth has had very little, in fact, to do with aid. Rather, this growth has been a result of internal policy changes in China, which have enabled the Chinese people to access a bigger slice of the growing global economy. Africa has much less to show developmentally over this period, despite the large influx of donor money. The wealth of Africans remains well below the global income average, falling from 18% to 15% of the global average per person during the last 30 years. In stark contrast, China's per capita share went up from just 10% to an astounding 75%. The sad truth is that most of the aid given to Africa has been wasted because either the governments receiving it never had the capacity to use it properly, which is why they need it in the first instance, or because it was given by donors primarily for strategic reasons, simply to maintain relations rather than to promote development. We have learned that aid for diplomacy seldom equals aid for development. We need to discover a new, better way of giving and of utilizing aid and also utilizing outsiders, whether this be in the situations of conflict or those countries escaping poverty. While donors would prefer probably not to rock the boat and just keep spending in the manner that they hope will keep their relations on an even keel, two major changes force an end to business as usual. In the next 30 years, Africa will undergo seismic demographic change. The continent is projected to double its population to 2.5 billion people by 2050. This has staggering implications. The numbers are startling. Listen to be kind. Listen to make a difference. Africa should be the booming center of economic development with what is called the demographic dividend. A large population of young people that can acquire new skills and power up innovation and economic growth. Instead, it's the site of mass youth unemployment and poor education outcomes. Why is this the case? Such circumstances range from a benign rejection of aid as a tool of sovereignty to a rejection of democracy by elites despite the preference of a vast majority of Africans for this system of government of others. We can no longer continue to make policy for ourselves, in our country, in our region, in our continent, on the basis of whatever support the Western world or France or the European Union can give us. It will not work. It has not worked and it will not work. Our responsibility is to charter a path which is about how we can develop our nations ourselves. It is not right for a country like Ghana, 60 years after independence, to still have its health and education budgets being financed on the basis of the generosity and charity of European taxpayers. More costly in this regard is the preference of authoritarian closed systems of political accountability in a belief that this will help get things done. We see this so-called solution increasingly today across Africa. To the donors, we ask them to make the observation and the respect of human rights and the rule of law a precondition for cooperation because we are all signatories to the Human Rights Charter. Although the end of the Cold War saw an increase in the number of African countries classified as free democracies, this number fell to just eight in 2020. This occurred despite clear evidence linking economic outcomes to the quality of democracy in the continent's 55 states. Donors have been complicit in democratic backsliding, whether by design or neglect. Such a combination of government and development has consequences. Africa's youth are, for instance, disproportionately disadvantaged and economically marginalized, accounting for 60% of the continent's jobless, 
their rate of unemployment averaging more than double that of the adult population. As the Arab Spring reminds, there are wider implications than just desperate images and frustrated social media posts. Around 40% of those who join rebel movements are motivated by a lack of jobs. With 200 million people aged between 15 and 24, Africa has the largest population of young people in the world. It is thus critical that we consider ways to use aid better and in the process to think of the policies that can enable us to live our lives beyond aid. Aid is of course not one thing. In addition to aid for development, there is humanitarian or emergency aid, given in moments of acute distress, and military aid along with peacekeeping support. Our people want to eat. Expensive poverty establishes six guidelines for these countries giving and receiving aid in this full spectrum of external involvement. The first of these findings is that there's no secret to success, no elixir or magic formula. Openness to ideas, to people, technology, to capital and trade goes hand in hand with development. This is especially true of countries which are trying to attract jobs which can go anywhere, which are dependent fundamentally on the cost of doing business. Of course, this approach also demands understanding at its core why Africa is poor. First of all, I believe after independence, we, many of us, many of the leaders jumped into the same seats, the same positions, and they inherited the same car, the same housing, the same lifestyle, fly in, fly out. And uh, so no wonder things would remain the same. Essentially, as the Archbishop says, come independence. And one set of elites was replaced by another. But the structure and focus of the economy changed very little. Thus, poverty becomes a choice of leadership. This demands tough-minded leadership, willing to make tough choices to challenge the status quo, the established ways of doing things. Success also does not rely solely on improving state capacity. Some donors prefer the state-centric approach since they themselves are governments, even if their intent is altruistic. Aid needs to be centered on the empowerment of the individual over the state since it's the individual who is going to create the growth and the jobs that are required for development, not the state. During the 1980s, Mozambique was one of the poorest places in the world, with a per capita income of just $150 per person. In the 1990s, things improved very slowly, the donors spending their money on improving the war-ravaged economy, trying to rebuild basic infrastructure, expending money on humanitarian assistance, trying to really make things better for the poorest of poor in this society. Here in the province of Tet, however, to the northwest of the country, something quite different and positive has happened. A large multinational, in this case a tobacco company, invested in an outgrower scheme around the turn of the century. Now, today, 20 years later, more than a million people owe their incomes to this outgrower scheme, which has nearly 100,000 smallholder farmers linked into the global economy. The key question thus for donors is how should you go about encouraging such investment? A second key finding is that fiscal hardware is a necessary but insufficient component of development. It has to be accompanied by adequate human software, skills and systems. Donors like to spend on infrastructure because it offers clear metrics of delivery. Recipients like infrastructure because it offers scope, much of the time, for gorging on contracts. In their first engagement with Africa in the 1960s, China delivered core infrastructure. It was not a good experience by and large, such as the outcome of the Tanzan Railway linking Zambia to Tanzania exemplifies. Badly maintained, the infrastructure quickly fell into disuse or misuse. 
In the second generation of engagement, China has enjoyed a well-earned reputation as a rapid deliverer of infrastructure. This has been a game changer for Africa, but there's also a darker side. The secrecy that shrouds its deal making has driven up African debt and encouraged graft by the political elites, rent seeking in another form. Debt is an essential tool for development, but only when it is spent wisely. Africa requires more than a hundred billion United States dollars in annual infrastructure expenditure. The solution is only partly in money, however. It is best when infrastructure is financed by whoever is going to run it, with a transparent mechanism by which they would recover their costs. This is the easiest means to avoid the type of corruption for which this sector is infamous, and the clearest incentive to build it as cheaply and run it as efficiently as possible. Listen to make a difference, not out of mind. I spent four assignments in Afghanistan as the advisor to various NATO commanders between 2006 and 2012. Those deployments taught me a lot about what was possible for external players and about the do's and don'ts of donors and especially military actors. Three key lessons stand out for me. First, that since the issues behind such conflicts are ideological and political, the solution must always be political. Much more effort should have been made earlier to incorporate and to accommodate the Taliban. Yet at the start, the donors could scarcely work out how to talk to each other and also to try and work out how to talk to Kabul, let alone the Taliban. A second lesson is that you can't fix these conflicts without ensuring regional support and alignment. This has to involve wider diplomatic efforts. These have to be sustained, involving much more than a concerned politician's glance, a stern expression, or another earnest committee. Diplomacy has to be built on, and by itself it has to build, long-term relationships, underpinned by understanding the facts on the ground as they are, rather than as one imagines them. Elsewhere, Colombia shows the value of international partnerships in ending and recovering from conflict. Andres Pastrana was president of Colombia who both attempted peace and then built an international partnership which ultimately ended the three-decade-long war with the FARC guerrilla movement. When I won the elections in 1998, Greg, I went to the United States and I said to President Clinton, in my campaign, I promote what I call like a new Marshall Plan for Colombia. So I said to President Clinton, we need aid to fight the worst problem that we're having, that is narco-trafficking. And Plan Colombia was based under the theory of what I call, Greg, responsibility. Closer to home, we know from the history of ending other conflicts the importance of regional and international pressure and the value of trusted leadership and interlocutors in any peace process, such as that which brought an end to the war in Angola, fought from bases in Namibia such as this one. You need all parties to the conflict to see that there's more to be gained by ending fighting than continuing with it and you need to have all international allies pushing them to the table. And patience by all the parties, insiders and outsiders, is the greatest enemy and most formidable warrior of all in making peace. Critically, every successful negotiation demands a dance partner to deliver. As former South African State President F.W. de Klerk became aware in the negotiations to a democratic dispensation in his country. The role that the late Nelson Mandela played in the negotiations for a new constitutional dispensation in South Africa was crucial. He had the stature to ensure that the moderate element in the ANC would come along and that the radical element would be silenced and would be forced into also acceding to agreements reached. He was committed to reconciliation, which forms a fundamental part of the new constitution. He was an erudite negotiator, realizing that only through give and take 
agreement could be reached and he was prepared to make sacrifices. He was a wonderful man and without him we couldn't have achieved what we did achieve from 1990 to 1996. There's a painful axiom that the period of state recovery from failure is at least as long as the period of decline. The causes of conflict are the product of generations, and it's foolish for the outsiders to go in expecting instant and durable success. A fourth critical insight from this book is that government needs to decide on its set of priorities and not try to pick winners or strangle the markets through overregulation. Donors should be supportive of efforts to create an overall enabling environment for business, which means reducing bureaucratic hurdles and logistical hassles. Donors are not always the best place to reduce bureaucracy, since they usually understand government needs better than those of the private sector. The two images of Mozambique, one of a country ravaged by more than 20 years of conflict, enabling a very slow turnaround. The other one is of a country of enormous beauty and unparalleled agricultural opportunity. The real question for donors and for outsiders generally is how do you help all farmers do this? How do you help people in the cities to lead more productive lives? The answer, I think, lies in encouraging governments to relax their control over the economy in places like Mozambique, particularly where they've had national liberation struggles. More private sector investment will enable a larger tax base and perhaps even some of those private sector companies can actually invest in the roads themselves through concessions, just like has been done in the port of Byron. Aid can of course help development. There's a popular notion that all aid is bad. That is a little like saying, I give you money and you are poor. That is clearly fallacious. But aid only works when donors and recipients alike can guard against vested interests. Those incentives which encourage donors to pour good money after bad and for recipients to never walk the talk of reforms. And for this to happen, both parties have to learn to say no. The fifth insight of the book. There have been many situations from Afghanistan and across Africa where donors measure their success by the volume of money that has been spent on the infrastructure that is built, rather than how it was used. A school, for example, is only as good as the teachers, not the quality of the classroom, even though that might make some difference. Thus, a mindset change is required by both donors and recipients alike. They must both learn not to be a cheap date. Finally, perhaps more than anything, the system of government matters. Donors have to learn to explicitly link aid to improvements in the quality of government. Leadership in particular has to be willing to employ the mandate it is given to make unpopular choices. This presents inevitably both challenges and opportunities. No governance accountability framework remains more viable than democracy and its attributes of a free press, freedom of speech, competition, and parliamentary oversight, along with institutional checks and balances. Yet, by 2020, fewer than 10% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa lived in free countries. We know from the evidence how well improvements in individual freedom work historically for development, and how governance goes hand in hand with liberty, equality, values, and rights. Democratic competition is a powerful force for positive change in getting the basic ideas and principles right. To act differently requires commitment and building an economy outside of donors. That demands asking exactly what it is that business needs and then providing that to businesses in order for them to make investments whereby you can grow the economy and thus ensure 
a positive cycle of stability. Development is about the transfer of much more finite and valuable resources, time, expertise and means. Herein lies the challenge. This form of empowerment is necessarily long-term and demands engagement and understanding and attempting to change the incentive structure which hinders development in the first instance. Whatever the area of aid expenditure, the overall intention should be the same, to try and reach the point that aid is no longer necessary. Even before COVID-19 hit, most African countries were struggling to lift their economic growth to levels that could provide opportunities for a large influx of young people. Rather than promote the sort of governance regimes that have enabled East Asia's transformation, for example, donors have not only struggled to disrupt these patterns of policy and leadership, but in some instances have simply reinforced bad practices. Aid is never going to solve all problems, but it can alleviate the worst miseries and facilitate a better future. If aid can be used to create this alignment of interests between people, leaders and institutions and act as a great disruptor, a lever for reform of a stultifying political economy and as a tool for growth, Africa's future looks brighter than the numbers suggest. If we can manage these challenges and change, better things lie ahead than behind. Don't pay the oppressor money. He's taking everything he can. We've got to make our own plan. Yeah, man, we've got to make our own plan. You know?